So we took the Fourier transform of our true sky, I, and we multiplied it by the sampling pattern of our array, which I could call uh, V. And then we took that whole thing, and we took the Fourier transform of it. So here, F is the Fourier transform of those two things. So, of course, we know from the convolution theorem that if we take the Fourier transform of the product of two functions, what we get out is the convolution of the Fourier transforms of each of them. So we get back our true sky, but it is convolved with the Fourier transform of our sampling pattern. So what is the Fourier transform of our sampling pattern? To figure out what the Fourier transform of our sampling pattern is, well, the sampling pattern was 1 at each sample that we sampled and 0 everywhere else. So if you want to figure out what your, uh, the Fourier transform of your sampling pattern is, you take your sampling pattern, you put 1s at each baseline position that you sampled, and then you Fourier transform that. So I'm going to draw a little line here to show that this is the Fourier transform of that now back in the image domain. And you'll see that on the sky, you'll get a central lobe of it, and you're going to get side lobes off of that. And because the Fourier transform of the sampled UV plane was called the dirty image, the Fourier transform of your sampling pattern itself is, just, is usually called the dirty beam. And in some ways, that's all there is to say about this. You have a sky, um, but based, because of how you've sampled the UV plane with your interferometer, you only recover a dirty image. But you know uh, that that dirty image is the convolution of the true sky with the inverse transform of your sampling pattern, and here is a picture of what the inverse transform of your sampling pattern is, your dirty beam. And so you'll see that each, uh, each uh, point in our true sky has been convolved with something that looks like the dirty beam here. And from that, you might be able to uh, use maybe some prior knowledge that you have to reconstruct something that looks more like the true sky. But I should stress here that um, you can't do this without putting information in. That said, it's actually quite common to, uh, to inject some extra information here. The generic name for this process is called deconvolution. And deconvolution takes information about your dirty beam, your dirty image, and prior knowledge and they feed them into something that tries to recover the true sky. Um, so what are pieces of prior knowledge that are often used? Well, one of them that's often used, in, uh, especially in low-resolution radio astronomy, is that the sky is made of point sources. If you assume that these are point sources, uh, you've given information about how to extrapolate between your samples in the UV plane, and this is because you know that a point source uh, has the same amplitude in any UV pixel that you measure. It's just a fat, uh, matter of getting all the phases of all the different pixels to agree on where exactly that pointing exactly to where that source is on the sky. So if you know that, um, you can guess that there will be point sources at the brightest points that you measure in the image, and then you can take uh, guesses of what those point sources amplitudes might be. Uh, you from that construct what you estimate the UV plane response to that would be. You sample that with your known sampling pattern, um, and then you create a residual dirty image that has um, some of the side lobes that were attributable to your guesses here removed from them. And then you can iterate on that, and that process is called clean. And so the, uh, the cleaning process, which assumes point sources yields a clean image. Um, 
And often people will refer to the deconvolved image as the clean image, regardless of what prior knowledge you put in, uh, even if you weren't assuming what is called what is true clean, which is that uh, the sky is made up of point sources. Um, other information that people often put in, um, if you don't want to make the assumption about point sources, which may not be valid, uh, for in our case, the sky was point sources, but if you had some uh, some broad emission out here, uh, then it's no longer a good assumption that this is a point source. Uh, and then you might want to make other assumptions, like um, another common one used with maximum entropy deconvolution is uh, the assumption that you should fit the smoothest possible sky that is consistent to your, with your data to within uh, the noise. That, and that's a parameter that you can specify what the noise is of your measurements. Um, and, and so maximum entropy will try to uh, create the smoothest possible sky. And that tends to be pretty good for uh, recovering smooth emission on the sky um, and is not so good at recovering point sources. The last thing I wanted to say here was to just get back to this W term here, uh, which we've ignored up till now. And as I had said that uh, this being a product inside of this uh, exponential here, the W term is something that takes the true UV plane uh, as a Fourier transform and it convolves it. Um, so I could draw little blobs here to reflect the fact that we've convolved, we've slid over this UV plane with a kernel that represents the uh, Fourier transform of e to the minus 2 pi i w times this other factor that actually in some ways accounts for the curvature of the sky, meaning that for any l and m coordinate this is the remaining coordinate that accounts for the fact that we have assumed that the sky is a sphere arching over us. So if we have a baseline where w is 0, uh, then in fact what we measure is the true uv plane. If we have a baseline where w is not 0, then what does that mean? Well that means that relative to our phase center on the sky, our antennas are not on the same level. So maybe we have two antennas here and one of them is sitting on top of a mountain one's down on a valley, and relative to this uh, phase center here, uh, there's a projection of that baseline uh, that is up and down, and that is the W component. And if you do that and you try to image towards this phase center, then you'll find that the uh, what you measure with that baseline is a sampling of the true UV plane convolved with a W kernel. That is the Fourier transform of this term in brackets. Um, and it turns out it's a, an area of kind of recent uh, development. I think it was 2004 uh, that it was discovered that you can use a term called W projection to try to uh, convolve your measurement back onto the sampled UV plane in a way that accounts for this, uh, this term and reconstructs a dirty image that is more akin to the Fourier transform of the sampling of the true UV plane rather than this uh, blurred out W projected component. If you had a plane uh, in which these antennas were at the same uh, height meaning that if you pointed this baseline with an antenna up on a mountain over towards a face center over here, uh, then relative to this face center, the, there would be no W component. And you could use this baseline to image the entire uh, sky for all L and M in a way that recovers uh, to within your sampling uh, your best estimate of the sky. Uh, but if you use this baseline pointed towards a different phase center, um, that's not true. That you will suddenly have 
a phase term that depends on L and M, meaning that whatever phase you use is only going to work over a certain uh, area of the sky. And so what you would see if you didn't account for this and you have a wide field of view is that if you took your sampled UV plane and created a dirty image out of it that sources away from the the uh, the center of the image would blur out. They would become kind of these rings here. And the amount that they would blur out would depend on how far away from the face center they are. So that's what happens if you don't account for your W term. Now for some arrays, especially ones with small primary beams where L and M are actually quite restricted, you may not even see uh, that, that you've blurred out any of your image because you may have restricted your whole image to be a certain area around here that your primary beam illuminates. For, for wide field uh, antennas and particularly ones with long baselines, uh, it's almost inevitable that you're going to have some W component and it's going to cause your image to degrade if you don't correct for this term. And a final note on W projection is that it's uh, absolutely not equivalent to delay your signal from your antenna uh, to the amount as if this antenna were down at the bottom of the mountain. So this is something that's often used in, say, beamforming or in, uh, in applying a phase term in order to, to point towards a direction, is to figure out what the delay between these antennas is and remove it so that you can pretend that this antenna is down at the same level uh, as the other antennas. But by putting in a cable delay of a fixed amount here, uh, you've assumed uh, the direction that you're pointing. That, that delay between here at the top of the mountain and the bottom only works if you're pointing towards the source right here. If you're pointing towards a different source, especially the blue one over here, uh, you would actually have no delay. So the reason why it doesn't work is that by putting in a delay of a fixed amount, you've assumed the direction that you're pointing, and that delay will not work for any other position on the sky, and it gets worse and worse the farther away from that position that you go. Um, the only way around this, and it truly is the only way around it, either you have to try to compensate for this term, or your W literally has to be zero, meaning that uh, you have to choose a face center that is uh, perpendicular to the plane in which those antennas lie. So that's the end of our second lecture on radio interferometry. We've covered a little bit more of how the response of a baseline looks on the sky with a fringe pattern. We've argued that that uh, essentially is a sine wave across the sky uh, in units of L and M, which are sine angles on the sky, um, and that uh, uh, to a very good approximation we can regard an interferometer as sampling the Fourier transform of the sky where U and V are the inverse angles on the sky. So for angular coordinates L and M, U and V are actually inverse angles. They are the Fourier complement of the sky. And we have uh, a bunch of antennas and they sample the true UV plane and we can use the sampled UV plane to reconstruct a dirty image of the sky and try to deconvolve uh, by the known response of our array and any prior knowledge we have about the sky to create our best guess as to a clean image of the sky.